Okay. Maybe first we should introduce ourselves. Over here is Mario Guarneri. Mario Guarneri. Roger Bobo. And my name's Miles Anderson. We are the three surviving members of the historic Los Angeles Brass Quintet who uh, were founded in, we think, about 1965-66 and concluded probably in 1974 or 5. Yeah, maybe in post we can get the precise date of our demise or conclusion. <laughs> hey, Roger, so I read a, a recent uh, obituary of Tom Stevens. He passed away this past July, I guess. Yes. June, yeah. That he uh, founded the Los Angeles Brass Quintet, and uh, prior to this little video making, we immediately disagreed with that uh, attribution. Well, what we, do you recall? I recall we've known him since 65, and he's been a trumpet player in our lives, and he certainly was partially uh, responsible for forming the Los Angeles Brass Quintet. I think the most positive forces, frankly, were you and me, and we had to nudge him to get it to happen. I agree. I think that's pretty much what I did. <laughs> and, and Tom came into the Los Angeles Philharmonic in the uh, beginning of the 1965-66 season. I think, yes. So that's why we think that's when the Quintet started, because Tom was definitely there at the beginning. But Mario wasn't, and uh, neither was Ralph Pyle. Ralph Pyle was older than us, he was French hornist, and he died, I believe, in 2008, but we'll fix that in post also. Uh, he was actually old enough, as a very young man, to be in the Second World War. He was on a, he was injured. Was Wayne playing in the orchestra? Yes, he oh, okay. come from this, he had been third horn under Reiner, uh, We're talking about Wayne Barrington. Wayne Barrington, yeah, French artist, excellent French artist. Also, parenthetically, a, a real mover in the organization of symphony orchestra musicians for getting better contracts and all that kind of thing. Uh, when he was in the Chicago Orchestra, but he brought in this associate principal horn in the LA Orchestra. He began in 1964, along with Roger. I didn't begin with the orchestra in 1964. Uh, the second week of the season, I was brought in as a substitute uh, because Rob took Marstella, the principal trombonist, had had a massive heart attack. Principal trombonist and our teacher. That's right. Absolutely. And Byron Peebles, another one of Mr. Marstella's students, moved from second trombone up to first trombone, and I slid, so to speak, into the second trombone chair for that year. So we started rehearsing for fun. That sounds probably right. And I, I don't know how we selected, if that's how we was Wayne. And who was the other trumpet player? Ronnie you Rum. You want to describe Rum to the... Ronnie Rum is a very famous trumpet player. He ended up playing with the more famous Canadian brass quintet. They were, they came after us. We were one of the first brass quintets that came up, along with the New York brass quintet. And subsequently, the Canadian brass quintet happened, and they were masters of marketing and still are. And we were, we tried. <laughs> Compared to them, we failed. Yeah. <laughs> no doubt. Well, we did all right. Yeah, well, proud of our work. But, you know, Ron Ron. Uh, he wasn't in the orchestra. The other four of us were. Yes. I think he may have still been in high school. I'm not sure. Yeah, uh, or a freshman in college, something like that. He's definitely younger than we were. You want to describe, you know, what you remember, Ron? Because well, he took his place, actually. Yeah. Then why don't you describe the circumstances about how you replaced Ron Ron in our great day? Well, yeah. The interesting thing was that I knew Ron from playing with Lester Remsen's Big Brass. Mm -hmm. And uh, there were a bunch of us young trumpet players in town. I was going to USC, Ronnie was too. I think Ronnie had just entered. And uh, it was Malcolm McNabb and Ronnie Ron and myself and Russ Kidd and uh, Tony Cloak. That's right. These were all trumpet players in the kind of the LA scene, trumpet scene. Tom 
and we were either in US, at USC or UCLA in some cases. I couldn't get out of UCLA for a little bit. Who else? I can't remember. Anyhow, do you have knowledge of that? No, I, 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 that was behind me by the time. Yeah, 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 right, right. So, but the interesting thing was, oh, that's so a little, we're just going to take a little break and uh, we're going to have some coffee and coffee. Gracias. Gracias. By the way, we haven't described where I we are. I think we should describe. We are in Oaxaca, Mexico. Yes. Because Oaxaca, Mexico is now my home. And so Mario and Miles came down to see me. Just for this moment. Yes. For well, this moment. Not, not, not just this, but, but there was, <laughs> since we're here, we definitely wanted to do it. But, yeah. Sure. Uh, you're dead? Yes. Oh, it, it's coming. Okay. That's special. Well, uh, cheers. So, so Ronnie was in school playing extra with the LA Philharmonic uh, in '65 and '66, and he came in the summer of '66. He was in New York. I remember this specifically. And he told me, and we met for coffee and lunch. I was in New York going to Juilliard. I just graduated, or maybe it was before the graduation. And he said, you know, next year, I'm going to be in the LA Philharmonic. There's an opening, and I'm, I'm going to get the job. And I'll be playing with the LA Brass too. Yeah, he's already was. He, yeah, and he was already playing with it. And I said, oh, it's great, bro, man. I have to do that. And I had no idea. I was going to graduate without a job anywhere. Yeah. So um, the interesting thing was, <clears throat> subsequent to that, uh, in the December of 1966, there was an audition for that opening. There was an audition for the opening in the LA Philharmonic. And I showed up for the audition, as did Ronnie and Malcolm and Tony and Russ. I didn't know all those guys were all the audition. there. In the oh audition. wow! Yeah. Yeah. There were like about thirty players. Yeah. yeah. And I got lucky and got the job. And uh, so afterwards, I saw Ronnie and I said. Felt a little funny because they yeah. said we had had this conversation. It was his job. Uh, right. yeah. But as it all turned out, Brian went on to fame and fortune. Um, and I had a little bit of, very little bit of fame, <laughs> a little bit of fortune. But but uh, great player and, and still a good friend. I see him uh, at different places. So we talk about that. So that's how I got started. And um, I guess by default, since Ronnie wasn't there, I think he left town after that. Yeah, he went back to Juilliard. Very shortly. Yeah, shortly Juilliard and, and, and I went. And you, you came in. And I started in January of 67. Oh, okay. In the orchestra. And, and then, and then um, uh, finished that season and then had my tenure the next year. It's a nice time to mention that in 1967, we were in the LA Philharmonic, and we took a 10-week trip around the world. We went everywhere. We went into Europe, into Iran. In Tehran, we played for the coronation of the Shah. That was, you know, that was the place to be in 1967, in November. Okay. So Michelle was well, we'll we'll stay out of politics. Right, but we have a lot of stories. We there's a lot of things we were in tell. Greece and Turkey also. Right? Greece and Turkey. And ended up in India. We ended up in India. Mm -hmm. That's great. But so you replaced Ron probably yes. right away. And but prior to that even I think Wayne was gone because he uh, needed to move on to a more permanent job at the University of Texas. So I think he must have been finished. He must have been there two seasons. I don't remember so, even seeing him. So he, 
Probably not. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's the story in itself that we'll just let go. But uh, and so Ralph Pyle, who was second horn in the LA Philharmonic, became our horn player. So then at that point, it was set. So if, if you've listened, audience, to our <laughs> old LPs, which have now been re released by Crystal Records, um, that quintet is the quintet that we'll, we'll be talking about. Tom Stevens, Mario Barneri, Ralph Pyle, French Horn, myself, Tom Bone, Roger Bone, too, and the other. I haven't heard that really new record good. yet, but I understand it's really good. The new record? The new well, the re release. Yeah. Yes, the yeah. new release. Yeah. At least they got all three LPs on the two CDs. It was on vinyl. Yeah. Vinyl used to be something that we used for making music. We don't do it and much in They're pretty frisky. <laughs> so there we were. What were you we doing? And oh, well, one thing: that, how many brass quintets do you think we were in the United, United States? Yeah, it was New York, and there was um, there's some university. And there was an American. Yeah, it was in the Boston area. And the Boston area was uh, the Boston Brass. Maybe. They were, called. they were very good. Yeah. And. Uh, but there weren't a lot. No, not like that. Today. That might have been kind of it. Yeah. Independent. There were certain brass people that were independent doing their own programs. Today, there are literally hundreds yeah. all over the world in every country. They have brass quintets. And yeah, they sound great. Yeah. Most of them. So, why did you guys start it? I mean, what, for what was the. What was, did you have enough to do? Anything? I think. No. <laughs> I think that was the reason. I was. I knew that. Miles and I. the answer to that before I asked. Miles and I had stars in our eyes that, about doing a brass quintet. That's true. But I think we, yeah. we were the. the the naive energies that made it happen. That's a good way of putting it. Naive energies. So how did you get Tom? I'm going to do the interview here. Yeah. So how did you get Tom to jump into that situation? He finally caved in and relentless uh, with some resistance. resistance. Said okay. And uh, he, he, he never never he never admitted it, but I think he thought it was fun. <laughs> you could say that about a lot of these. Yeah, yeah. We oh, we can go now. He's gone. He's been, that's terrible. But we are yeah. all we all love Tom. Yeah, that's for sure. Listen, but in 1968, we took a tour, another tour. And we went to. Oh, that was a brass quintet. Yeah, Iceland. Yeah, that was the first. We brass. started off in Iceland, and then we went to Ireland. And then we went to Germany, didn't we? Yeah, the we, yeah, we were in Norway in uh, Oslo. So, yes. Mm -hmm. Ireland, we were there for a week. Yeah. And Miles was driving the VW oh, bus that was on the wrong side of the road, often. Uh, yes. I remember, oh, out of a I, remember I started driving and then you guys begged me to... <laughs> no, that's 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 uh, inaccurate memory. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I remember driving out of the airport. I don't know why I was delegated. I don't know either, but yeah. I'm, I was very nervous for everybody. We had a Volkswagen bus. Yeah. With the whole band in it. Yeah. And they were very quiet. Very talkative group was very quiet. And right into Dublin and down to, remember where we went? Gorey. 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 Castle Bar. And Roger Book. Limerick. Uh, Ballina. Remember that? Galloway. Yeah. And those days, I thought I wanted to be a concert manager. Yeah, so you booked. The I was moved concert, right? in the direction I thought being a concert manager would be the coolest thing in the world. That was a nice day. Until 1968, and we went on this tour, and I realized the uh, 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 bullpucky that I had to put up with to. Did Stevens give you a little gas on that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, why are we staying but here? But retrospectively, <laughs> retrospectively I, I think Stevens, in a weak moment, remembered the Irish tour with, with fun in his eyes. Right? Yeah. He, he referred oh. to it a couple of times that that was really fine. Yeah. And we ended up in Holland. 
and in Herfein. We made the our own. Herfein. We made our own uh, Parchisi game. Oh yeah. Uh -huh. You remember that? Table no. we, we, in a town called Osterwolder. We were, we're, in, we're in into Parchisi at the time. I think that was Stephen's thing. I think so. Well, that was there was nothing else to do. Yeah. With. So then we made our own. Yeah. But anyhow, yeah. No, and I remember in the in Ireland we played in churches, little churches and uh, convents and stuff like that. And because, and for many people who had never heard of brass quintet before. Yeah. Right. The first concert was in Gordy, and that was the day that Robert Kennedy died after being shot the day before the death. And the, um, Gordy was a small town just south of um, Dublin. And the community revolved around the church, and the welcoming gentleman for us was the Irish priest. Yeah. And remember he took time out to sort of, it was, I don't know if the blessing is the right word, but thoughtful words about the passing of, uh, you know, Robert Kennedy, Americans, the were Americans, and all this. And of course, the Kennedy family were Irish Americans. Yeah. It was a very touching yeah. Yeah. Of course, for Traumatic times, yeah. that's for sure. Right, the same priest took us out after the concert and introduced us to Guinness. Frank more than most of the people. I remember we went to court. That was when we were back in Dublin with the Irish radio. Yeah. I had a very good manager. Yeah. And didn't we take. Uh, didn't we have to take a small flight somewhere on that tour? Oh, yes. That I refused to get on. But I, the one? Yes, but Ralph yeah. did do it. Ralph, Ralph did, he got very... Yeah, he got. He had to sit. He uh, had a reason, I mean, real reason. Yeah, for the time. Mine from the second war. war. Yeah. But it was from, <laughs> it was, I think, the flight... I'll never forget, we, we showed up at an airport and we looked for the name of the airline. And we kept looking for it. We couldn't find it anywhere. This was and finally we asked someone. They said, "Well, they don't have a desk. You have to go through this door and yeah. <laughs> through this little door." And there was this small plane. Yeah, this was was management had the <laughs> economics in mind. <laughs> yes, man. And so I said, and there was there was some doubt if we were going to all get in there with our instruments. And I said, "I'm on the train. I'm good." And I got a train. And you did that. Yeah. So this Finally was, so did Ralph. This, wasn't this from Bremen to Amsterdam? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think so. Well, yeah, I had forgotten there. about that. Yeah. Of course, that's why there's three of us here. <laughs> and, and, but on a flight before that, um, it was a normal airline, but it did some kind of banking. Yeah. And uh, Ralph. Ralph was very uncomfortable. Yeah. yeah. Anyhow, that was a, that was a fun yeah, and it was, yeah. we hadn't done any recordings, and it was about six weeks. So maybe we should explain that in those days, Los Angeles Bill Mike was not a full-time job. So at the end of the more or less winter-spring season, we had six to eight weeks off before Hollywood Bowl started. So yeah. we took most of the month of end of May into June. Was it really six weeks? Maybe it's long. long. Yeah, maybe it was four. It was four. It was four anyway. Yeah, yeah. It was four. We should have. But we were in Iceland. Iceland. Yeah, I can remember we were there quite a while. We were over prepared for that kind of thing. Yeah. Well, we <laughs> can tell them where we rehearsed. This is good word. Uh, we rehearsed in their little band rehearsal hall called the Hjom Scala. <laughs> the Hjom Scala. Scala means hall, and Hjom is music. The music hall, Yom Scotland. But I do remember this this place where we my my memory is that the place where we rehearsed was sitting right next to the, the water. Yeah, definitely the water. Yeah, yeah. And it was like the most isolated place you would have felt. I don't remember there being anything very close. No, it, it was, was in the glide path for uh, the oh, airstrip okay. too yeah. for the Reykjavik. Airstrip, the airplane would look like they're going to hit the building. <laughs> but it was really... Uh-oh, that's interesting. <laughs> just as soon as you see the airplane, I see how right. <laughs> Anyhow, I just... I, 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 but actually, it wasn't that far from downtown. No. Uh, it was back there in the snow. 
the uh, I don't know, Bam, 2006. And, yeah, we did. And then we went to Iceland party, Icelandic people's party. Bam. Oh, and here, here's it. It nothing to do with music, but they were switching from right hand drive to left hand yeah. drive, or vice versa. Uh, and the speed limit was five miles an hour. Till Hairy Hunter, they called it. <laughs> yeah, right. To the right hand side. Yeah. yeah. Good. You must have spent a lot of time. And, and I did, actually. Oh, and you remember reading the sagas? And the no, I mean, I didn't read them in Icelandic. No, no. But I, it was hard enough to read it. I had a recorded course in Icelandic on 78s. And, uh, <laughs> and it was made for the United States Army. So it was, I learned how to say good morning and things like that. And, Pretty soon they started teaching me how to say load the cannon and uh, <laughs> and it wasn't appropriate. No, it wasn't for two weeks. But uh, then what happened? Did we, did we did the first recording after that when we got time? No, we'd already recorded. Oh, we already had. Oh, yeah. I think yes. Oh, definitely. Okay, yeah. so we should talk about the first recording. Yeah, I'll share something. Uh, Let me start with that. Okay. When do you think we did it? I. Every time I hear one of these things that we did a long time ago, for example, I think we did it in 66. But anyway, uh, it was surprisingly good. Technically, sonically, it wasn't the same as we're used to now. But the, the new record, I assume, has been fixed. I don't know, they could have. Uh, Peter may not have wanted to. We had some had uh, great arrangements that you did. Little Hungarian. And I, um, and I ripped that off to a certain extent from Herb Rosenthal, French Hornets did in uh, Los Angeles. He did a lot of good. We played the Alec Wilder quintet. Hindemith was on it. Yeah. Petzl uh, Sonatas. I the uh, variations. Uh, Paganini. Yeah. Yeah. Which I hope I, I hope the music exists. Yeah, we're gonna search for that. I had three crates coming to Mexico from Japan. Two of them arrived, and the third one disappeared. With the Paganini. With the Paganini. So, I tell the story about Peggy Mee. So I ended up playing the, the solo part on the, on the fat. One of the, the fast variations. That's because he had an unbelievable fingers. The only reason was fingers. because he had a great fingers. He had a great fingers. He had a great fingers. He can say that now. Yeah. Well, he actually, he said it. He said it. Yeah, he did. He probably said the only reason he got this part is because yeah, he played it. Yeah, that's right. So, anyhow. But, um, but we, uh, yeah, I mean, I think we had a lot of time. It seems like we rehearsed a lot, a couple of times. Yeah, I, yeah, we did a couple of times. Yeah. Roger and I used to get together and play Roshu uh, etudes yeah. a lot. Yeah. And actually, Tom and I, I remember, would play duets and stuff. And, and, and we we came out of the same tradition, having, having studied with with uh, Les Remsen mm -hmm. and Bacchiano and Stan. Mm -hmm. They had three teachers in the common. Mm -hmm. And so, um, so sound-wise, we had conceptually, time-wise, we had the same concept. Mm -hmm. and, and, and playing in the orchestra together all the time. We were always, they had a strange situation in the section where there were two teams, um, and mm -hmm. we kept Together, I always played with Tom and Herbie played with Bob. Yeah. So, uh, so we had a lot of time to, to lock stuff in. And after a while, uh, I remember when I left the orchestra, I was shocked to find that everybody didn't play like Tom. Oh, <laughs> 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 well, wait a minute. Yeah. You know, is it, I, am I only I going to play your time around here? <laughs> yeah. it, it was just it was really interesting. Um, and that was true. I played with a lot of great players who play good time, but it was just that transition of, of being with them. So. Well, I do think the trumpet playing is one of the special things 
I think in the, when did we do the Japanese recording? 1968. In 1968. In the autumn. We were in Japan. Well, Miles started playing bass trumpet on the old music, the old Italian Renaissance music and the pezzo. And I found the tuba very cumbersome. And I tried to play it on contrabass trombone. I didn't have the slide technique or the muscle to make the slide move that fast. So I had a contrabass trumpet built in F. So we had two trumpets, bass trumpet, and I played contrabass trumpet. And I haven't heard that album in 50 years until yesterday I played it for the first time. Miles brought a new CD of those takes that we did in Japan. And uh, I don't want to brag, I have to be careful. But it's amazing. It's an amazing sonority. And uh, I, you know, for the brass, for the brass uh, fanatics that are going to listen to this tape something. Cylindrical sounds sound really good when everybody's playing cylindrical instruments. Yeah, yeah. Sure. And I know Tom, I remember Tom was really happy about that. Right? All trumpets. Yeah, great. Yeah. yeah. And I was telling Miles last night, one of the things that I did, which would probably never happen now, but I always played B flat trumpet when Tom played C. And I did that in the orchestra and I did it in the Only on the air, the trumpets, I think I played, I think we both played the D trumpets on that. That's but otherwise, cool. yeah. Otherwise, I always played B flat. And I really felt that my role as a second player at that point was to to kind of help bridge that gap. That we have to put that uh, that CD you gave me of the Italian Renaissance music and the intimate modern music. But it is, it's stunning. And it's a nice feeling when you haven't heard something in 55 years and you sit down and say, what's this going to be like? And you don't mind listening to Man, it. Man! That's right. Yeah. We're, we're as good as the young kids around here. Now that does we were work. as good as the young kids around here. We so saying a lot, but it was good. It's yeah. probably, in many respects, our best efforts, I thought, as an ensemble, as our sport trumpet. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, well, when this uh, video goes on YouTube, we can post the... Uh, you'll be able to yeah, the yeah. information will be out there. Well, you, no, we can just, they can just stream that. For any of my students who <laughs> see this, your homework, is to listen to that, whatever in whatever form it comes, it will be out soon. Mm -hmm. There you go. So, so we did the first recording. I'm trying to remember the order of recordings because we did the. Uh, you know, I looked it up and, uh, for Peter actually, yeah, uh, for the liner notes, and, but I don't have it very well in my head. But the second recording was certainly after 1968. Right, I would have had to have been. Yeah, on the third one, which must have been done around 1970, I think uh, that, yeah, generally, that had Frank Campos' piece on it. Yeah. What did we commission, actually? Think of, about that for a moment. Well, we got Roger Cowley. Roger Cowley wrote us a stack of short songs, he called them. He used to play those. This high, right? Yeah. And we'd make sweets out of those. Great. We did Frank Campos' piece, this commission. Joseph Bird. Uh, I'll try and post this. It's a like a very scratchy recording. It's sort of supposed to be the title is great. Uh, the March King in Purgatory. Right. So it's a, it, it's a, a play on uh, John Philip Sousa. We would play. We had first of all our all our instruments were had contact mics on the mouthpieces. And we had fragments of Sousa marches, and we went. And, no, no, we played them. Oh, we played them backstage, yeah, right, so the right, audience right. couldn't hear us. And the lines from our mics came up to stage, and Joseph had to be there, and he would take the output of our uh, microphones and run it through a uh, 
Ring modulator. Ring modulator. It went through a ring modulator. So what the audience Probably heard, nobody knows what that is anymore. Yeah, right? well, it was a prominent effects processor at the time, and he would operate that, and the loudspeakers would be out there. We were nowhere to be seen or heard, just our sounds were used as material, really. So it was a kind of a, a hazy, vague memory of the many years ago, sort of a ghost of John Philip Sousa, yeah. in a way. Oh, it's it's a, a easy to me, yeah. I'll tell you that. <laughs> but we did it, and uh, it was pretty, uh, that was pretty far ahead of us. Yeah, we did a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. we did. Uh, we played a piece by Harold Flagg. That's right. Um, that I used to play with my sheet back in the Something about Hakarinda, yes. right? I can't remember the exact title. Very colors. soft and very, yeah, it was a graphic score. A graphic score, no, yeah. no numbers. Yeah. Very gentle music. We played uh, Take Five, Barney Child. Childs, that's right. That was a. Speaking of Take Five, we played for Mario's wedding. Oh, yes. <laughs> and we played the <laughs> Norwegian <laughs> Woods. But who was it that made the arrangement in five? We were talking last night, we couldn't. So they were trying to do the processional. Right. And we were playing. So they had done the act. Yeah. And not the best way to start the relationship. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us what happened after that. Uh, well, <laughs> it went well for many years. Yeah, it went through the marriage. Yes. <laughs> yeah. That's terrible. We'll probably have to take that. I'll have to take that. Oh, oh, well, I mean, okay. But, uh, hey, I was just trying to think. Tom Scott wrote a few sports. Believe it or not. I mean, yeah, I, played I, I just saw it. Recent, I don't think we played it, though. I don't think we would have rehearsed Now we probably should have. It was actually a certain way. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I remember now starting. We'll post this too. Remember, uh, post this too. remember uh, Gospel Brass? A little. That was another Joe yeah. Bird. That was a little commercial thing we thought we'd try. So I think we should just talk a little bit about how this quintet, in a lot of ways, uh, broke a lot of ground for subsequent groups that came along. I mean, we were doing stuff that, uh, even though the New York was doing, had similar, similar stuff. I think we were a little bit more into the contemporary music. I think they were maybe, uh, and I don't mean this in any derogatory sense, but probably a little more conservative right. uh, group uh, programming. Oh, no, way stuff. more conservative. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But they were excellent. Yeah. And they, they did set the standard, and they were the first. And they, I don't know if they entirely made their living off of between that and their freelance and we, New York City work. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and taught. And yeah, Bob was teaching Yale. Yeah, and we we played it on the ITG first one of the first conference in Denver. In Denver, but that was considerably later. That was <laughs> definitely I I'd left and gone to San Francisco, and okay. there's a lot went down before that. Well, one thing that we used to do that was. Uh, different. Uh, we would begin a concert. We did this quite a few times. We'd take an Andrea Gabrielli uh, canzona and play it with four trumpets out in the, what do you call it? Atrium? No, no, not atrium. The hall, where you walk in, before you walk into the hall. So oh, come on. Lobby. Lobby, thank you. In the lobby, we played that in the lobby after everybody had gotten in. And only Ralph Pyle was on stage, sort of dimly lit, off to one side. And we knock out that uh, canzilla, nice and strong, bright, and there'd be this pause, and then Ralph played a very quiet solo, right. contemporary. I think we should short. assume that we influenced the Canadian brass because they do well, that's sort a big, of the same thing. That's a big jump. For Even now. Time. We'll let you uh, <laughs> take that for RB. Ronnie, if you're not there. <laughs> well, I don't know about that. Okay. Could be. <laughs> but, and then while Ralph was playing, then we go around backstage right. and get out to the next, whatever it is yeah. we were going to do. Yeah. So we try to be, be um, 
you know, more imagined we do the country mm -hmm. shoes. Set things up. Yeah, we worked really we worked our butts off on Gun to Shoe because at that time for musicians that was not an easy piece to do. Is the, uh, I have a funny story about the Gunther Schuler. Is it going to be when Pierre Boulez came out? No. Okay, we'll tell that afterwards. Then. Okay. <laughs> no, the, the Swedish brass quintet came to Los Angeles, and they came to my house twice a week, and I coached them. And uh, do you remember that one that was in 6 8? And they played it, and they were, it was so good. And I remember how we worked <laughs> to get it together. Yes. And, and uh, it was very dangerous. There was so much activity and the rhythm was so strange we could get off and not know it for uh, 30 seconds. Well, that's a I said, how did you guys get that? It's, it's absolutely perfection. Oh, we have the D's, a digital. Metronomes, <laughs> and we all set them together, and we played, and it worked very well. <laughs> well, times have changed. Yeah. Yeah. They're probably playing in high school now. Yeah. But no, I mean, when we were doing it, it was a big challenge. And we wanted, that's now I remember what it was, we wanted to try and commission Pierre Boulez to write us a brass quintet. And you'd known him from Concertville, right? And he was a very outgoing dude, really. He, he was a nice guy. Yeah, and then Flashman, the executive director of the film, I had a good relationship with him, and he, he brought him down and awesome to it. That's right, to your house in the Pasadena. Yeah. Spent an entire afternoon. Yeah. He's, and in the end, he said, uh, that and was we a played, big, big deal. We played that Gunther Shoes <laughs> part, it, you know, inspiring. And he just said he was not interested in uh, writing for groups of the same instrument the family. He wanted uh, disparate uh, things. But he was very patient and sat through the entire afternoon. What a nice guy he was. And I remember driving him um, back downtown after the Yeah, yeah. It's a yeah. good story. Yeah, he, uh, he's a really great guy. Speaking of great people, it brings to mind the end of the film. Oh, yeah. He's going to record it. Yeah. And we rehearsed with it. Yeah. Yeah. And Byron, we're, we're going to do it uh, with six. six. It works with six. Yeah. And then uh, and I've and he got it. I had the back. pleasure of conducting that that piece in a lot of places. Yeah. Oh, but you, in you Hong Kong and Italy. Yeah, well, we weren't going to do it with the conductor. I guess he was going to be at the sessions. But remember, we were all set up. We were rehearsed. Yeah. We were going to record, and we were down at the, the church, and we couldn't get the sound. There was distortion uh, so the from started. the tuba, and the, we were getting different tones in the trumpets. Mm. And But they came out as, as distortion, and we couldn't record. We couldn't figure out. We tried everything. We brought a big umbrella in, remember? Put it over the tuba. So then what happened? So then we, we did so we're going to put it off. Yeah, yeah. Right? That's right. And he died that summer. Uh -huh. And we were going to try again the following fall in a different place, maybe. But we we played that we played in it. the L.A. Philharmonic with Michael Tilson Thomas conducting it. Oh yeah, that's yeah. Great. We also played another. Piece. It was the overture for the concert. Yeah, it was no, six of us. Yeah, yeah, it was a very good. I was past my. Yeah, we also played another piece that you didn't play on that Tony Johnson thing that played, which was a piece for Grass Quintet. There's a poster, there's a picture of us standing in front of the poster. Oh, 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 I know what you mean. That, that, that was during that uh, period when you weren't playing with us, and uh, Tommy was, Tommy Johnson. And it was the, uh, there was a piece by Gunther Schuller for, oh, Brass Quintet for Orchestra. Rather short. Yes, pretty short. Uh, yeah. yeah. A little brass music? Uh, it might be. No, a little brass music. Oh, I know. No, that was the clue. That's right. You're right. Triptych. That's correct. Yeah, yeah triptych. Yeah. A little brass music by Schuller. We, we also yeah. played that. I played that one. One it was strange programming. I don't know what maybe you were thinking. There was not a very long piece, and it was the entire first half. I don't know what the second half was. Yeah. But clearly, people saw that that was on the program, 
stayed away. <laughs> you guys remember those? There was really a sparse attendance to those concerts. Because uh, this is on the uh, LA Philharmonic uh, Urgent Series, right? That was, that was remarkable. Yeah. Well, let's see. What else did we do that was kind of interesting? We did the usual things that Quintets do now, which play children's concerts. Lots of those. A lot of those. Young audiences. And young audiences. Um, we talked a lot in our concert. I mean, for the we yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And after a while, we found out who we really liked to have talk and who we really didn't want to have talk. Really? Yes. I think we. I think Let's talk made about that. Decision. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. And and I I remember Tom assigning pieces. Don't you remember this? He'd say, "Oh, you and, talk, you introduced oh, that one. You talk about that." Okay. Bo, you can't do that one anymore. Don't talk about that one. And I think we really we kind of got written out of the script. Could have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, think I kind of. I I was allowed to say. Maybe I benevolently forgot. Well, who talked? Well, what was Ralph, 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 Ralph and you? Ralph was okay. Ralph. I think Tom might have. Although it's hard to imagine. I don't remember him talking. Maybe he just told other people. I thought that's how. I can't remember for sure. <laughs> this is but we, the, West Point the, back then. The act of actually communicating with the audience was something we all thought was a good idea. Yeah. Which, which not everybody did at the time and still doesn't do. And I think I, we were sort of good at it, yeah, actually. I think, we're yeah. that, that's the I think it's gone the other extreme now. There's a lot of yakking in contests that maybe we could do with yeah. Yeah, you're more music, less talking. Yeah. Well, it's, it's gone crazy. Yeah. And but costumes, and drama, and well, well, the makeup. We had our own costume. Yeah. We had uh, white turtlenecks. And, uh, yeah, that was a mistake. Oh, that was very cool. <laughs> it was very cool. They were just the opposite. They're extremely hot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, it's like. Oh, oh God. Uh, yeah, I remember we went out to what was the name of the uh, the guy at the clothing store in the valley. And we all, I think Steve, that's something we get organized, right? Yeah. Everybody, yeah. Yeah. yeah, we had that. Those it was those tur white turtlenecks that were so hot. And we had that. It was just before. Later on, it was sort of more rock and roll. By the time that Denver concert rolled around, we were definitely not wearing those white turtlenecks. Yeah. Why did it stop? When did it? Oh, I don't, you know, I've been thinking about that. Well, I left in, uh, in the end of 1971 because I went to San Francisco, but the quintet kept going. Quintet kept first going. with Dennis, right? right? Dennis Smith, who's no longer with us, actually. Yeah. Was, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. yeah. Byron played. And then Byron, and then Dennis left and went to Seattle, maybe, or someplace. Yeah. And then Byron played. And then I came back and played, and this is something Stevens organized. I don't know how he did it. Do you remember? But it ended up the quintet sort of got reconstituted around what summer did was it seven, summer '73? We went to Denver. Yeah, I forgot. Maybe that's how it happened. Stevens may have gotten that ITG concert because of his contact. And well, uh, yeah. I, I think that was it. And he was very intense to go there because John Pierre Matez was there. And he and John Pierre Matez were really tight. Already? Or did they think that? I thought we met them. I think well, we maybe they met them. But I mean, they were tight until a couple of months ago. Well, I don't know what the motive, his motivation was or how he worked it, but I do remember getting called. And then Dave, Dave Craig, a long time uh, renowned. Uh, Principal French Horn in the San Francisco Symphony. And I was still playing in San Francisco. I lasted three years and I was out. And then a uh, week joined. Yeah. Joined. So it was, yeah. you know. And, I, and, we and went that was a reunion of Tom, Dave, and myself who were at Pacific Music Camp when I was 11. Yeah, 12. And they were like four years old. And that's when Tom and I used to play in the jazz band together. Tom has a t shirt on, pulled up suits. <laughs> that's it. Right. That's yeah, that. I used to listen to Chet Baker. Yeah. And uh, if you're really hit, you have a pack of Lucky Strikes. And I your... still actually, maybe, if I, I think I have a recording of Tom and I playing in the big band, and he was playing piano and I was playing trumpet. And if we have it, we'll throw it up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Literally. 
because that was funny for sure. <laughs> so we, we went back to um, Denver. Yeah, that was a big gig. We started getting kind of, we're trying to get more major works. That's when the last gig, we got that winery gig. Oh, we had an agent. Yeah, but she, yeah, but that was when Janet Pollard was the agent. I was still in L.A. Yeah. I don't think that was still happening yeah. in '73, '74. But we did play in Montalvo. Yeah. How could we get together? I got a great picture that we'll intercut in here of the five of us uh, outside holding our instruments, sort of laughing about something. Oh. Uh, TK took those pictures up against the. Uh, oh, TK took <laughs> TK Wang, uh, violinist in the. Also, you know, yeah. We're starting to feel like survivors here, you know. Yeah, yeah. Last yeah. Couple. yeah TK took. I'll never forget. We went up my neighborhood of Hollywood and we found this wall with all that graffiti on it. And, and That's right. And, uh, you know, where was that? that? You don't remember those pictures? Wait till you see it. Oh, yeah, your hair was that. Uh, the whole thing. Yeah. You, have, you probably have the Andy Dell robot. <laughs> Occasionally I see those pictures. With, uh, I preached in the two months. I don't know what to think. Yeah, well, I'll tell you, my kids was a long time ago. Just think of acid. Oh my God. <laughs> Dad, what are you doing? <laughs> Sure, your case. Yeah, we're here everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> that was out of the National Guard. Yeah, uh, anyhow. Yeah, anyhow, so I remember those pictures, and that was with Dave. Yes. And you, yeah, that was that. Okay. So we must have worked for a, a yeah. couple of and, weeks. And Dave had a bass trunk. Right. Yeah, and that, it was in C. It was the one pitch above mine. That's, that's, right, right. that's where I, I saw that girl play C the other day, and I said, I've seen him C before. Yeah. That's where it was. The European. It's yeah, he made that work, and he well, made course, the, yeah. the trumpet quintet. That's right. So we play five part baroque music, we actually finally have that. Yeah. And when do we do the the recording with the San Francisco Symphony? Uh, that was before that. That okay. would have been. Um, so it's been around. Probably uh, late 72 or maybe that kind of 73. Also, but yeah. yeah. And on the Venetian brass album, which is goes from brass choir down to the quartet, we were the quartet. Right. At least at the time, I thought those were our best recordings. We were, I don't know what it was, we were really together. I was in San Francisco, I actually seen this one back then. But it was four trumpets, and those, it was all Baroque, right? Yeah. You listen to those, man, like Guami, and one of them was one take, even, which was... I listen to it even today. Yeah, it's Cooks. It's wonderful. It's, it's wonderful. Yeah. 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 Makes it. I think some more people ought to... Of course, you have to have a contrabass trumpet bill. Well, you know, uh, I was thinking if a chimbasa would have accomplished the same thing, no. but... I don't I think, think so. Bass string, ground for bass trumpet had more sizzle than a chimbasa. Yeah. And what, what key is a chimbasa? F. Oh, it is. Okay. I was going to say fa, but F. But yet you had a, didn't you have a, a fourth valve on your country bass trumpet? Yes. And what did that put it into? C. Okay. Yeah. Um, C. <laughs> yeah. Roger, when you were playing most of the stuff in the quintet, what instrument were you using in the quintet? Well, uh, I mean, I started off playing C2, but all the time. Yeah. And then I got the idea, specifically on Petzl, that maybe the F would sound better, and it sounded way better, and that, that started my pathway. Yeah. No. You recorded on that first uh, LP we made, it's definitely on that. Yeah, for sure. See, it was cumbersome. You know, I still, when I when I, after, when I get a chance to coach quintets, and my triple player walks in. Oh, yeah. I, there's too many gigantic things go marching through this piece, and it's just not working at all. Yeah. No, I, I don't think there's something doing it. I have been a judge. In international brass brass ensemble competitions, I forgot which Passau, Germany. And, you know, you can just tell yeah. before you hear a sound if it's going to work or not. Yeah. Well, remember, in the orchestra when you were first in the orchestra, I think throughout the years I played, 
in the other. You were playing a 184. Little Woody Yeah, yeah. I really like that a lot. And that's when you play C2, you use that. Well, and then it was. If there was a lot of material that it was too small for, I made it work. Yeah, I thought But, so. uh, you know, a bigger tuba definitely sounds better on Bruckner, Wagner, and uh, Mahler. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. One thing we never did that I can remember is play rotaries. No. I remember when we first started playing rotaries in the orchestra, and uh, and I remember jumping. Uh, Zuma wants the rotaries and the singer and I said, oh, "Good for those things, you know. They're really out of tune." And, yeah, and I said, "Well, let's get a double for it." And so we did get a double for it right over there. I got a double for. Playing F2 button. Yes. Now you're getting into what we were really concerned about. <laughs> well, you want to hear the whole story? They but gave me a double for playing F tuba until they found out I had an invitation to go play in the Cleveland Symphony when they gave me a big raise and said no more double. Yeah, they covered Oh, really? Yeah. What was the rhythm section behind this? That just I have no <laughs> idea. That's not bad. <laughs> So, Roger, I, I recall that probably mostly you and me had fantasies of uh, not having orchestra jobs. We're going to be full time brass quintet, probably late 60s. Remember that? I, I can remember even going out and asking a guy named Clarence Wiggins, who uh, was head of the music so, department at Cal State Northridge, if there was a spot. Could, put us in and actually said uh, on a part-time basis, yeah, we could help. So we had cows, cows. So that, that's right, we should get to that later. But Roger, uh, when we were off camera here, you were telling how you'd been thinking about it before we even had a Los Angeles. Uh, even while I was in college, I was dreaming it would be just wonderful to have a brass quintet that we would live in the same place and rehearse every day and create a level of playing that the world had never seen before and I, I lived that fantasy and uh, while I was playing in Amsterdam and with the Concertgebouw I went to London for a weekend or a few days and I went around to see concert managers and one of them suggested you know you ought to rent cottages. You could get, go to a village and rent five cottages for each of you and your families and live comfortably and uh, make your fantasy come true. And it, it really grabbed me and I thought we could make it work. And amongst those managers that I was introduced to was Fleischmann, a young Fleischmann. And he was very kind. What was he doing at the time, remember? Yes, he was the manager of the London Philharmonia, I think. <laughs> Philharmonia or Philharmonic, I'm going to get it right. But yes. And uh, he was very encouraging, although I, I can't even imagine how naive he probably thought I was with my dream. But that's that was my dream, yeah. and I was really into it. And oh. then you and I met. Yeah. And you were almost parallel with my. Yeah, yeah I, I'd be as naive as anybody. <laughs> <laughs> you know, though, actually, I mean, in England there was not brass quintets particularly, but certainly brass bands oh. that, for all intents and purposes, were full-time jobs. I mean, that's not a small example, but. Brass but of course, when I mean, you say brass quintet to an Englishman, they relate to the brass band, not the brass quintet yeah. like we know. Sure. Yeah. But you know, I, you bring up that whole idea of, of an alternative to the orchestra job. I mean, I think in those days, our training and the way we were prepared to be uh, professionals 
based, yeah, I think like, I'll speak for myself mostly, but I mean, we were, I was a trumpet player that did a lot of different kinds of music. It wasn't an orchestral trumpet player. Like, I mean, I, I, I really, even when I got to Viking Island to study with him, he said, bring the Arvin's book and your B-flat trumpet. <laughs> and that's all we did. Even though I'd done that three times already, we did it again, and I got, you know, I got my ass kicked. And, um, and I was playing Latin gigs after, you know, after, um, after Radio City and doing all sorts of things, gigging and doing all the and I think, And I think the idea of playing in an orchestra was great, but I think, for me, the musical part of what the quintet offered was you know, far and away more uh, satisfying in, you know, in, what, in a certain perspective than a lot of the stuff I did, especially as a second trumpet player. I would think of the same. Yeah. So, so it was, but I, I'm not sure that's still true in this age of specialization with people who are studying just to be orchestral players, because I don't, I, when I work with a lot of the young players now, they don't even have really the flexibility to play in a quintet and to hear things in a different way. Um, and it's kind of sad because I think that the, you lose this whole sense of musical. Uh, I think it's a big mistake when you go to a music school and you study orchestral passages for four years. Yeah. That's insanity. Yeah. You know you're going to be heavy-handed and inflexible and neurotic yeah. well, by the uh, time you finish before you get your done. music education. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I went to Cincinnati Conservatory and I was, I mean, I learned, what I was trained is to learn how to play the trombone. And, and, Orchestra was sort of part of it, but it didn't. The, the, for, unfortunately, there wasn't really much of an orchestra program at that time. Mm -hmm. uh, there, a lot of places were short on string players, uh, and I worked much more in commercial music. And I learned orchestral excer excerpts really with the Los Angeles Philharmonic. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there, uh, hanging on by the skin of my teeth and fingernails. But but yeah, that has, that has changed, and yeah, I worked. And I'm glad that I did all the different kinds of yeah. jobs I did because sort of cross fertilizes. I, it's absolutely things. necessary now. You cannot be a symphony orchestra specialist because, you know, you can be the best trumpet player in the world and you go to an audition and there's 99 other guys who are also the best trumpet uh, players in the world and it's hard to decide. Yeah. And uh, there's no guarantees you're going to win. Yeah. And if you have in your heart that you only want to play in a symphony orchestra, it's not a bright future. You, the realism is not guaranteed. Well, yeah, and I think, I think we all got into it because we love, love playing music and love playing our instrument. And, and you know, I'm still doing it. And, and, and Let's do it home. Yeah. Right, just start doing it. Yeah. <laughs> Next time we have so, we're going we're gonna to play some trios for you. Oh, okay. yeah. <laughs> right. I'd like to have a tuba just to yeah. maybe play 20 minutes a day. Yeah. I'd like to, but you know, I, I, I just think I just think that uh, I, I get students now who once, you know, they know I'm not in an orchestra. They know I'm not, you know, I, I stopped taking gigs where I had to read music about 10 years ago. <laughs> and so I don't do those things anymore. So I have students who come and say, "Well, you're still, you're still practicing, you still play every day." I go, "Yeah, I mean, it's part of my life. I play and I enjoy playing, and I'm you know, doing other kinds of music." Now. But I think, I think that was uh, there was a time that the, the quintet was part of that portfolio, if you will, you know, stuff that we did. Well, at the time, it was really important. Part really of important. Yeah, yeah. 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 And, and exposed to. Exposes us to a whole bunch of different kinds of music. I mean, it's uh, incredibly uh, fruitful and uh, nourishing. As I know another thing I remember an experience that also caused me to want to, I wish that I wasn't in the orchestra, the quintet wasn't in the orchestra anymore. We had booked a gig, I think it was in Visalia. 
and we cleared it with the Philharmonic. There was no kind of And the Philharmonic changed their schedule. And we booked this thing probably a year in advance, right? At least nine months. And Fleischman, I remember calling Fleischman saying, hey, you know, we had this gig, and it was, it, it was, the Philharmonic gig was not like down at the... Right, it was on the river. I mean, yeah, it was a it was run out of Southern High. Man, no way would he let us out. We had to cancel that job. That that was a dream. Yeah, that, that was, was totally unnecessary. And I remember one time we had to fly. Oh yeah, we did that twice. Job. I like to it. another. Oh, job. I remember that. And uh, yeah, I remember you guys remember it because you were having a great time in the back of this little airplane, and I was in the front just you know getting some religion. Uh, you know, you flew on one. Of them. I flew on one of them. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't fly both of them. No, you didn't fly the one where I think it was something like I say, up in the San Joaquin Yeah, I had a a concerto somewhere. I think it was in Europe somewhere, and I wanted to play it, of course. And I had it booked, and the orchestra recorded Lieutenant Kiji oh. and. A Bruckner Symphony, and Fleischmann let me go. Really? Yeah. And subsequently, people have told me wow. how good I sounded on those two albums. <laughs> <laughs> I said, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I was on every LA one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It sounds good. That's funny. <laughs> well, Tom, maybe he played it. Norman. Norman. Oh, it was Norman. Oh, it's Whitney. Well, it was. Well, he's got the job now, so he. Yeah. He, uh, well, as well. yes, he did. That's that relics. That was good. Yeah. So again, thank you, Ernest. Yeah. yeah, that was a good one. But he wouldn't let our little brass quintet out no. on a Sunday. Some reason. Yeah. 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 So. Well, are there any? Let's just think about it. Are there quintets, any working quintets out of orchestras now? I don't think so because the orchestras are so busy that the energy level to maintain and go out and compete. No, with... Joe Leslie says that, uh, that there is a place in the New York Philharmonic. As a matter of fact, but that's it. What do they play? One job or two jobs a year? Pro oh yeah, probably. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I don't know how much, but I mean, it does exist. Oh, there, yeah, there was an interesting group that came out of Cleveland. It was called the the Second Players Quintet or something. Like that. Oh, really? Oh, really? That's a good idea. Group two. I wanted to go out and you know buy a block of tickets for you, but I, I thought I didn't. Do it. So it was like all the second chair players. Yeah, all the second chair players, and they, of course. You know, having sat in that position, be highly motivated to get out yeah. and play some stuff. Um, not true, people will, but, but for the rest of us, it was. Well, now wait a minute. Uh, would the two player play with the second player's group? There, <laughs> please, the <laughs> being the principal two, but this would which be I almost thought the term principal two yes. was a. Uh, was that another song of old people? Yeah. yeah. Uh, principal and only, you know. I mean, <laughs> I've, I've used that I'm, trying to get a raise. I'm a principal too, Mr. Knight. All the other principal players get paid a lot. I mean, is there any workers who carry two tuba players that are one could be the principal? Actually, there are a couple of opera orchestras. Well, of course, yeah. I'm sure nobody's strong enough to do everything yeah, all the time. Sure. Well, well, let's maybe, see. Maybe we've I'm going to say one other thing. One thing yeah. we don't say, yeah. the friendships that have come out Bravo. of oh, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. Um, that first association, for sure. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah. and, and here we are, the 60%. Yeah, yeah here we are. And I can't believe you guys came down. Oh, we have missed it. By the way, unbelievable. Yeah. for those of you in other parts of the world, Come to Oaxaca. It's magical. It's yeah. a wonderful place. Wonderful place. If I wasn't 81, I think I would, uh, especially under present circumstances, be uh, <laughs> well, you know, spending more time down here. Uh, I'm 80, and it's only but recently. But you already made your move. <laughs> I made the decision 
just recently. This is it. Yeah. I'm I'm going to stay here. A wise choice indeed. Well, I guess I have to say I'm 75. Yeah. And and, uh, just a kid. Just a kid. But I, I'm more than happy to come back for the uh, semi-annual or, or quarterly. Yeah, uh, we should make it quarterly because it's, <laughs> we're, we're running out of time. Yeah, we're, yeah, actually time. So we're, we're, in, we're in the coda. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But uh, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm really up for uh, yeah, the, um, the reprise. Yeah. Well, I think one eight, it's not unreasonable. Come down once a year. Yeah, sure. You know, in the central square here, there's music going on constantly. I mean, it's. I'll bring down my carbon fiber trombone, and I, they, I won't be heard among these guys. It's really sort of right. like uh, yeah. a Mexicana Charles Ives. Yes, the sounds exactly. Are, yeah. Yeah. Catchy. Okey doke. Right. This was fun. It was indeed. Thanks for letting me out. Hello, Miles Anderson here. It's August 5th, 2020, and I'm in my apartment here in San Francisco, California. Roger Bobo's in his apartment down in Oaxaca, Mexico, and Mario Guarneri is over in his home in Fairfax in Marin County, about 45 minutes north of San Francisco. We had intended to get together down in Oaxaca uh, late last April or early May and make a video uh, following up on the one you've just seen and uh, correcting a few things, adding a few things maybe, and more importantly, just getting together and have another hang down in Oaxaca. But with the ongoing pandemic, obviously that isn't possible and may not be possible for quite a while. So in the meantime, this short video I'm going to make will have to do. I'm simply going to follow up, correct a couple of mistakes, uh, clarify a couple of things, maybe a couple of little bit of a, pieces of additional information. Beginning with the founding of the Quintet it was definitely in May of 1965. Uh, there's an article in the uh, Los Angeles Times, an interview with Martin Bernheimer, and we said that very specifically. And then I found a audio interview uh, that I did on KFAC-FM in Los Angeles um, in the later 60s, and I said exactly the same thing, so that must be a, a genuine fact. Los Angeles Brass Quintet was founded in May of 1965, which means that Tom Stevens had finished up in Dallas. Uh, we wouldn't have started the quintet unless he already had his position, uh, his third trumpet coming into the Los Angeles Philharmonic, replacing the retiring Albert Mancini. And now, thinking about it, I do have a vague memory that Tom may have even left the Dallas Orchestra a little bit early, but in any case, he was definitely there in May, and we got it going. When we were going through the list of brass quintets that existed either before or during the time we were active, uh, and it wasn't uh, all-inclusive by any means, but we left out a very important one. Uh, the Los Angeles Brass Ensemble was a brass quintet that was uh, formed by trumpeter uh, Lester Remsen in the late 1950s. And in fact, uh, Mario and I both uh, played in that group, and I met Tom Stevens playing in the Los Angeles Brass Ensemble. So it was a very important group to at least the three of us. During those years, Roger was either back in um, Rochester at Eastman or in uh, Amsterdam playing with the Concertgebouw. So he wasn't involved in that group, but three of us were. So uh, just want to uh, make note of that, honor that. Uh, we all appreciated the uh, the opportunity to have been part of that. And Tommy Johnson was the tubist in the in that group. Uh, Irving, Th Irving Rosenthal was the hornist, and Chuck Brady played trumpet, Mario, Tom, possibly even uh, Ron Rom. Anyway, Los Angeles Brass Ensemble, Lester Remsen, director. 
Where did we record our uh, LPs? The first one was done at the home studio of Bill Henshaw, a renowned hornist uh, I associate primarily with Warner Brothers. He was under contract there for many years, was part of all those great movies they made, and especially those cartoons. Uh, Warner Brothers was famous for the cartoons they produced all those years. Anyway, he had a you know, pretty professional uh, setup at his home out there, especially for those days. Uh, it was really dry, as many recording studios are, and the recording ended up pretty dry. They actually released a recording on the LP, mainly because we were just inexperienced and um, didn't insist on getting a little more reverb added when it was mastered down at uh, TTG Studios in uh, Los Angeles. Anyway, Bill Henshaw was the engineer, and it was his studio for the first LP. The second one was engineered by Stuart Plummer, and it was done at one of the uh, two-year colleges, or possibly Los Angeles State. I really don't remember. But um, that was the situation for that. And the third recording was done by Lester Remsen, was probably one of his first projects before he um, was using the Wilshire Methodist Church uh, in Los Angeles as a, his recording venue for many years. This was done probably at Valley College um, in a band room, which also <coughs> was a recording studio because you can see in a photograph there's a, uh, a control room there and uh, anyway that's where the third LP was recorded uh, Ernest Fleischmann, uh, this is just a trivial thing, but he didn't come from the London Philharmonic or that he, he was the uh, executive director of the uh, LSO, the London Symphony Orchestra. And from there he came to the Los Angeles Philharmonic and uh, had a profound effect on the orchestra and its development during those decades following that. And we mentioned that we had this really sparse crowd when we performed the Schuller uh, work for Brass Quintet and Symphony Orchestra, the Diptych. Uh, and uh, I looked up the program on that poster in the photograph. The uh, companion piece was the Furtwängler Piano Concerto. So the Gunther Schuller work for Brass Quintet and Orchestra and the Furtwängler Piano Concerto was not a big draw uh, over that subscription set. Not too surprising. The Wedding March in Mario's Wedding, the one in 5-4, in a article in one of the San Francisco newspapers, that march was attributed to none other than Tom Stevens, and that makes a lot of sense. That would be something Tom would enjoy doing, writing a 5-4 march for his colleague Mario Guarneri's wedding. And was it Norwegian wood, as Roger remembers? Well, I sort of think he's probably right, but that isn't what they said in the newspaper, but there you go. Main thing is, Tom wrote it. And Ralph uh, Pyle played uh, towards the end of um, well, at least my tenure with the quintet, probably around 1970, well, definitely 1970, played an alto trumpet, and there's a photograph of it, and that's how I finally got my memory jogged. That photograph was taken at an outdoor concert that we did at Cal Arts. We were the brass faculty, our quintet was the brass faculty of the original California Institute of the Arts. And that first academic year, 1970-1971, the new facilities out in Valencia weren't uh, built yet. They were still under construction, so they hired um, or rented a former monastery in Burbank with the name of it I forgot. So we were doing an outdoor concert one afternoon there, and um, that's what the photograph is. In April of 1971, there was a really large uh, earthquake, and that uh, old monastery took a big hit and could no longer be used. It was condemned. So for the remainder of the semester, we did go out to Cal Arts and finish the uh, semester there, and the, well, I was still being uh, finished up in construction. So that's it. I think that covers the 
few little things we're going to talk about. Hopefully, in the not too distant future, uh, the three of us will get together and uh, yak it up again and record it down in Oaxaca. In the meantime, be safe, be healthy, and very best wishes to you all. Thank you.